Greetings, gourmet types everywhere. I'm Funky Monkey. Welcome to my house of love. Sequels. Some are expansions of a story or its world. Some are revisits of a character after a period of time. Some, of course, are latent cash grabs mandated by greedy studio execs. But audiences are receptive to their favourite characters in a brand new adventure. And the marketing department certainly loves a franchise. So, sequels have become an increasing fixture in the cinema of the 21st century. Why am I telling you this? Because today we're reviewing a sequel. The sequel to Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs. Called, imaginatively enough, Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs 2. Without the original writer-directors Phil Lord and Christopher Miller at the helm, this 2013 sequel had a lot to live up to. Flint Lockwood and his friends return to the ruined island of Swallow Falls, now an overgrown jungle, complete with the unlikeliest wildlife. So leave your knife and fork behind, but don't forget your umbrella, because once again, it's looking decidedly cloudy, with a chance of meatballs. We open with a hitherto unseen retcon, to introduce genius inventor Chester V. After a short recap of the first movie's plot, and if you haven't seen Cloudy One, I recommend my review of it, we return to the island of Swallow Falls, moments after we left. And who should turn up but Chester V himself, or at least a holographic avatar, V and his Thinkwinauts have accepted the task of cleaning up the giant food that litters Swallow Falls, and the displaced residents are offered temporary accommodation in the hometown of V's own company, Livecore. Because that's not a dead giveaway at all. Seriously, the graphic design practically screams read me in a mirror. And so our protagonists are transported to the Californian coast, where Flint gets his start at Livecore. But as ever, his inventions aren't all that brilliant. Undeterred, unaware, and unlikely, Flint is overexcited at the annual Thinkonaut vesting ceremony. Which is just the opportunity a secretly concerned Chester V needs. For you see, Chester V is having trouble delivering the latest iteration of his flagship product, the Food Bar, and has thought to recover the DFR in the hopes that it might revive his flagging fortunes. And with Flint so enamoured of Chester, and now so very despondent, he'll do anything for his idol's approval. Firstly, the great lie is woven. The concept of mindless evil. Ever has it been a useful tool in manipulating the naive and foolish. And so the team is gathered, and our heroes return to Swallow Falls. Flint persuades Tim to guard the boat, and the team set off to investigate and find a new friend, who's almost more trouble than he's worth. Because he swallows the USB key that purportedly would finally switch off the DFR, but its true purpose, well, stay tuned for that. However, Chester V enters the picture again, and when Barry is threatened with being cut open, nature takes its course, and the key is retrieved. And that's all I'll say about this scene. Tim Lockwood has had enough of twiddling his thumbs, and sets out to recover his bait shop. But after an encounter with a tribe of wild pickles, Tim finds a new mission. Teach a pickle to fish, and you'll feed it for an entire lifetime. And save you two quid a month for my Patreon. The team return to Flint's lab, and recover enough raw material to put an end to the Genesis DFR. The next day... Our heroes set off to finally find the DFR. But a running with a taco dial gives Sam a new perspective on the foodimals. A perspective that separates Flint from his friends, and reveals the true nature of Livecore. Gasp. What a surprise. I never saw this one coming. You know, suddenly I miss Phil Lord and Chris Miller all the more. Flint rediscovers the DFR, now the centre of an entire ecosystem, and finally realises the truth. Just in time for Chester V to reveal his truth. Yes, in a shock to absolutely nobody that was paying attention, 
the USB key actually reprograms the DFR to be part of the LiveCore ecosystem. And Chester V reveals his entire plan to a disbelieving Flint before pushing him into the drink. Bad science. But then, Chester V seems to be a bad scientist. Team Lockwood is ushered into the evil tower. But then, Barry delivers Flint to his father. And so the stage is set for our finale, as Flint is cast into the evil tower and makes his way to save his friends. But Chester V holds all the cards, and none of the sympathies. Policeman Earl is powerless against police tape, but Steve the Monkey isn't, and he loves the Celebrationator, which is all Flint needs to distinguish the real Chester V from a fleet of holograms. And our hero grabs the remote and saves his friends. Friends, a concept which seems alien to Chester V. Witness then the demise of a bad scientist. Oh, nasty. And so the Genesis DFR is returned to its rightful place, and all is well. So that was Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs 2. I know, it wasn't a terrible movie, but I really can't put this one into my house of love. The most jarring part of the movie for me is the revelation of Chester's plan. It just doesn't ring true that a world-class executive CEO would risk the fortune of his entire company, his reputation, and his very life, in fact, on the acquisition of a malfunctioning invention. Aside from this, I don't even see why it was necessary to have an antagonist at all, except maybe to get the plot running and get them to the island. And even then, it could have been achieved in other ways. On the bright side, however, the returning characters remain as lovable as ever, and the Foodimals provide genuine spectacle to this fine family film. It looks gorgeous, it's as colourful as its predecessor, and it does move along at a fair old pace. I just can't get over the nonsensical idea of making a villain out of what is essentially Steve Jobs. And I'm no kind of Apple fanboy, believe you me. I think their technology is overpriced and not all that great. But anyway, I've been Funky Monkey, wishing you better days and better movies. So long, folks.